So the topics for today, this will be our final day uh, on mechanism design, and we'll be talking more about mechanism design uh, without money. And we'll be doing a case study in the first part of the lecture that will be on kidney exchange. Uh, and I would be remiss to not tell you about stable matching. So that'll be topic number two. So kidney exchange and uh, sort of a great application of mechanism design without money just over the past 10 years or so. So there's a lot of people with um, kidney failure out there. So there's a lot of people who could really use a kidney transplant. And an old idea, which is not specific to kidneys, but you know applies to all organ donation, is that you have deceased donors. Okay? So I and probably many of you have that orange dot on your driver's license, uh, which says, yes, you're going to go ahead and donate your organs. But there's something special about kidneys, which is we have two of them. And uh, generally, we do just fine with only one. Okay? So if you're living, right, donating a heart isn't usually much of an option. But uh, donating a kidney is. Okay? So there's a notion of living donors uh, when it comes to kidney transplants. And so think about you know, someone's spouse, someone's sibling, et cetera, who's, who's actually happy to give up one of their kidneys for a loved one. All right, so there's a problem, though. Sometimes it just works out. Okay? Sometimes uh, you know, just uh, your spouse or your sibling will donate you a, a, a kidney, and everyone lives happily ever after. The problem, though, is that uh, it is not the case that anybody can really successfully have a kidney transplanted from just anybody else. There are compatibility issues. Compatibilities. Um, blood type is a big one. Uh, tissue type also. These are the, these are the two first order um, issues that determine whether you're compatible or not compatible. Uh, so for example, if you're a patient with blood type O, then you really need a donor whose blood type O. If you're a donor with blood type AB, uh, you really need a patient with blood type AB. Okay? And that's not the only issue, but that's one of the main issues. So that can be a bummer when the people who are willing to donate a kidney to you are incompatible. So here's an idea which started occurring to people, or at least it started getting uh, executed toward the beginning of this century, which is suppose we had the following situation. We have a patient, so someone who needs a kidney, and they have a loved one who'd be willing to donate a, uh, donate a kidney, and they're incompatible. So let's say for concreteness, that this patient has blood type A, whereas the donor has blood type B. So those are not compatible. But suppose there's another pair in the same situation, a patient, a potential donor, incompatible, and the patient here has blood type B, and the donor has blood type A. Okay. And these two pairs of people, generally speaking, will have never met each other. But if they knew they existed, right, despite the fact that they naturally showed up in these pairs, it seems like it might be a really productive idea to swap donors, even though you have no idea who they are, even though you never met them. So the donor from the first pair could just donate compatibly to the second patient, and the donor from the second pair could donate compatibly to the first patient. Okay? So this is what's known as kidney exchange. Okay. So around the beginning of this century, kidney exchanges started happening just isolated cases, kind of lucky um, ad hoc uh, occurrences uh, at a couple of hospitals. I think Johns Hopkins was one of the early pioneers. And, you know, they worked great. I mean, lives were being saved. 
And so then the obvious question is, well, you know, if, if we can do this and we can save lives this way, uh, you know, why don't we want, we want to make sure that everybody's aware of all of the incompatible patient donor pairs out there. Okay? So you want, in effect, a quote-unquote market for these pairs, okay? in the sense of awareness of who else you could be matched with. And so, you know, a clear question then that people had to think about 10 years ago or even a little less was how should you organize ideally a nationwide kidney exchange? Okay, so some kind of database where everybody who's in this situation, person who needs a kidney, someone's willing to donate, they're incompatible. Pairs like that can go and register and you can look for ma matches across the nation. So in some sense, you want to create a quote-unquote thick market with lots of people in it so that you get as many matches of this form as possible, so that you save as many lives as possible. Okay? So what I'm going to discuss today is some of the theory that was done right when people were beginning to think about how to answer this question. I'll give you a little glimpse about sort of what's been concerning people over the past couple of years as well. But the national exchanges were indeed formed uh, roughly the middle of last decade, and these are done now regularly. Okay, so there are algorithms which find matches that are run periodically. Uh, I, I had trouble finding the exact numbers, but I'm pretty sure it's thousands of transplants a year uh, are done because of the algorithms and the mechanisms that have been designed for these national exchanges. Okay, so this is a, this is a, this is a big deal. Right? Now, it's not an accident I'm covering this case study on our week in mechanism design without money. So at least at present, uh, any kind of compensation for organ donation is illegal in this country. In fact, in every country except, I'm not sure exactly why this is actually, uh, except in Iran. And while, while the waiting list for kidney transplants is roughly, you know, 100,000 people now in the U.S., there is not a waiting list for kidneys in Iran, okay? Because you can, in fact, buy one legally there, right? There, of course, are black markets other places as well, but it's a completely legal market in Iran. You can have an interesting debate, you know, maybe with your friends over dinner, you know, either, either speculate or argue what's morally appropriate. You know, fast forwarding 10 years from now, it's not obvious to me this will still be true. It's not obvious to me there will still not be a monetary market in this country. I think it's an interesting question. First question is like whether or not you believe there should be one. Second question is just, you know, place bets, will there be one? Okay. Okay. So I'm going to touch on um, two early papers, meaning uh, a little less than 10 years ago, um, by Al Roth, who's now here in the Econ Department and won the Nobel Prize in Economics last year in part for these contributions, along with Sunmez and Unver. And uh, so the first idea, when, so in the first paper in 2004, these were ideas they were having before they really started talking seriously to doctors. Okay, so they were sort of just brainstorming at that point. And uh, idea number one was to, in fact, um, to have better matches between patients and donors, apply the very algorithm I left you with on Monday, the top trading cycle algorithm. So I described that algorithm in the context of a housing allocation problem, which was the frame, same phrasing that uh, Shapley and Scarf used back in 74 when they developed the solution. And the correspondence here is, well, before we had agents and their initial house. So in the context of kidney exchange, this is going to correspond to a patient and their donor, their incompatible donor. Okay, that's like their initial house. So in addition to the initial endowments and the housing allocation problem on Monday, there were preferences. In that problem, we were modeling preferences as a totally ordered, as a total order over all of the houses. So in this case, it would be a total ordering over the donors. 
and the sensible ordering over donors you would use as a patient would be dictated by your probability that that particular donated kidney would be a successful transplant in you, okay? which is what your doctors help figure out. So transplant success probabilities induce total orderings over the houses, i.e. the donors in the system. Okay? So the rest of the correspondence, total ordering of houses, um, probabilities of success. And what I hope you remember from, uh, from Monday was, you know, this was this uh, algorithm where everybody proposes to their first choice and you look for cycles. And cycles are, opportunity, are is an opportunity to make everybody better off. Okay, so everybody sort of grabs what they want more. And as you go around the cycle, everybody has something that's better off than what they had before. So what you're really hoping happens when you run the top trading cycle algorithm in this context is you're really hoping for just sort of simple things like this. Okay? So you're going to have a node. That's a P. And in this context, a node represents the pair, both the patient and the donor, that are incompatible with each other. And then you're going to have a second patient-donor pair. And so the initial endowment here is just D1. The initial endowment here is D2. And, uh, but each one, right, so these are incompatible. If I'm using the same data as on this slide, these are incompatible with themselves, but each is compatible with the other donor. Okay, so certainly... Uh, this node has a preference for this initial endowment over its own because donor D2 is more appropriate for P1 than D1 is and vice versa. So in the first iteration of the top trading cycle algorithm, whenever you say to everybody, point to your favorite house, i.e. point to your most compatible donor, you just get this nice little two cycle. And the top trading cycle algorithm then just says execute the swaps, okay, which just basically says donor D2 goes to P1 and donor D1 goes to P2. And one thing we did note, we said a few things about the top trading cycle algorithm, but one thing we said is that at least everybody winds up as well off as before. Okay, so the worst case scenario for you in participating in the system is that you wind up with the same incompatible donor that you started with. Okay, and then the best case is you wind up with someone uh, that you're much more compatible with. So that was sort of idea number one. Maybe we can just apply the top trading cycle algorithm out of the box. Okay? So there are some issues with doing that. And so let me tell you one that's sort of easily handled in the same model. And then I'll tell you about two others which really motivated changing the model for the, for the second contribution. Uh, so in addition to just proposing that tools from mechanism design should be applied to the need for a kidney exchange, and in addition to proposing that maybe the top trading cycle algorithm could be useful, they also worked out the following extension, which was they said, well, you know, actually in the real systems, in the real exchanges, you don't just have these incompatible patient donor pairs. You also have um, patients that do not, are not lucky enough to have a, a living donor. Okay? So that would correspond to an agent who does not initially have a house in the housing allocation problem. And in fact, there's also things that correspond to a house with no owner in this context. Do you see what that is? Right, so a deceased donor right, does not come along with some you know, patient that they're trying to say that they're incompatible with. Okay, so that's a house with no initial owner. That could be allocated to anybody. Okay. So the extension was to, in addition to just the basic patient donor incompatible pairs accommodate patients without donors and then also deceased donors. Again, corresponding to agents without initial houses and houses with no initial owner. And uh, they showed that you could extend the top trading cycle algorithm to this more general setting. Okay, so in addition to swapping on chains, now you're swapping sometimes on paths. Okay, because basically a house won't point to anything by itself, um, and so on. 
And it remains dominant strategy instead of compatible if you implement it properly. And this is a little tricky, actually. So this is not, um, you know, if I had 45 minutes of lecture time to devote to it, I could go through it. All of you would understand it. But it's not just a trivial extension of the basic algorithm. You do have to do some work. One thing that was amusing was actually the, the algorithm that they used for this extension had already been worked out because it had been motivated by a totally different problem roughly six years earlier, which was that of assigning students to dorms. So there is, they wanted to use a, one of these top trading cycle-like algorithms, but they had this issue where you know, there were some students who, say, had been juniors and now are seniors, so they were incumbents, so you wanted to give them the option of keeping their current room. There were new students, freshmen, just showing up, so they didn't have an initial room, no initial endowment. And then there were the students who graduated who left some empty rooms. So you get, had this sort of ecosystem of incumbents, people with an endowment, rooms that could go to anybody, and then people with no room. So that's actually the context in which this algorithm was developed, but then they realized uh, it also made sense in this kidney exchange context. Okay, questions at this point? So, let's talk about a couple other issues with this first idea. Okay. So remember the top trading cycle algorithm. It, uh, people point to their favorite remaining good, and then you get at least one cycle and you swap along these cycles. Okay. So in that example, it was a two cycle. Okay. How big could these cycles be in general in the top trading cycle algorithm? Yeah, you have no idea, right? I mean, you might just wind up with a Hamiltonian cycle in the very first iteration. It's possible. And in general, you might get long cycles, okay? So that's just an observation we could have made yesterday. So fine. But now, so is this, why is this an issue? Okay. Well, to explain why this is an issue, let me actually back up. Suppose it actually was just a pairwise exchange. Suppose we're back in the most basic case, P1, D1, P2, D2. Okay. So, and suppose we do the swap. Okay. So how many surgeries, how many separate surgeries does that entail, this pairwise exchange? Four, actually. Okay. There are two people you've got to take a kidney out of, and there's two people you've got to put a kidney in. Okay? So that's four separate surgeries. Now it's clear that you know, a given pair, right? So the, you know, it's clear that you know, pairs of these have to be done simultaneously. Right? So when you take the kidney out of this person, you're going to put it basically immediately into this other person. Okay? So those happen at the same time at the same hospital for sure. Okay? What about the two different pairs? Okay, so what about P1 and D2 and then P2 and D1? Can those happen sequentially, asynchronously? Or do you think that might be asking for trouble? So something that could go wrong if like you first did P1 and D2 and then like tomorrow it was scheduled to do P2 and D1? Yeah. Say what? Yeah, I mean they might get on a plane to Chile, right? That's what you're worried about, right? Um, so you might be worried about reneging. And it's really kind of a, it would be kind of a double whammy if that happened. So the first thing which you might you know, rightfully complain about is that in some sense you know, P1 got a free kidney, and D2 didn't have to donate, okay? Which is, you know, seems unfair. But actually, the much more serious problem is that P2 did not get a kidney, is as sick as before, and lost its only leverage to be in this exchange in the first place. Okay, so their sibling or spouse actually no longer has a second kidney to donate, okay? And that's really kind of a deal breaker. So as far as I know, um, it's never been tried when you have these exchanges, these cycles, to do them non-simultaneously. Okay? As far as I know, they've only been done simultaneously. So no one's even had the opportunity to kind of pull that kind of a shenanigan. Okay? So, all surgeries on a cycle have to be done simultaneously. One thing that's sort of interesting is, is actually there have been chains being done recently, just the last couple of years also. 
Uh, one reason that the chains have been happening is because of altruistic living donors, as they're called. So sometimes you get someone who just, in effect, walks into a hospital and says, I want to donate one of my kidneys and save a life. And they don't have anyone kind of in mind. Okay? And so with, when you have this initial living donor, then in fact they have done chains of even up to, uh, I think, 30 people. Okay? And that, has not been, that is not simultaneous. Okay? That is done sequentially over a month or two. And if you think about it, the sort of, if somebody reneges along this chain, the first issue we talked about before, someone getting a, don't, a kidney for free is still there. But the second issue, which was the really serious one, which is someone not getting a kidney and losing their donor, that can't happen if you start with an altruistic donor. Okay, so people have been experimenting with these sequential ones, but for the cycles, they do it simultaneously. Okay, and if you, and so remember, you know, if there's K people in the cycle, there's going to be two K surgeries, which have to all be synchronized at exactly the same time. And you need a different operating room, a different surgery team for each of those. Okay? Point being is, you really, really want to actually have to keep these cycles short. Okay? So that's issue number one. So again, this model started coming about as the economists were talking to doctors. Yeah? Uh, how many different possible types are there? What do you it seems mean? It like if you only had a few, like, say there are five different types of kidneys. It seems like, then there, it seems like that could affect your cycle lengths. Like, you might as well take from this guy as from this guy. Yes, so there's some, so there's diminishing returns for having longer and longer cycles because of the reason that you say. So still in principle, you could have arbitrary long cycles, but uh, I'll get to this in a second. I mean, about exactly where's the sweet spot? How long should the cycle be? And because there aren't that many types, there's no point in having super long cycles. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, right. So, I mean, really, I mean, this ordering is going to just come from the doctor, and that can be for everything. I mean, people definitely travel for these, though. I mean, that's sort of not, I mean, that's a pretty second order effect. When it, you know, you've been on this list for a year, you know, and you're on dialysis. I mean, it's, it's kind of a second order thing, having to travel. Especially this is just the U.S. So, but yeah, I mean, all, you know, with your doctor, you would formulate kind of, uh, you could use in some sense whatever information you want. Okay. That said, I'm actually now going to go in the opposite direction. And, uh, you know, empirically, again, you know, you started talking to doctors and how things really work, and you realize that actually this total ordering model is kind of not the right model of preferences in kidney exchange. I mean, really, if you're one of these patients, you just want to know, you know, is the transplant kind of probably going to work, or is it probably not going to work? It's much better modeled as a binary preference as opposed to a total ordering. Okay, so in empirically, uh, patients exhibited and their doctors exhibited basically no... Um, relative ordering amongst equally compatible kidneys. Okay, so it's really to first order a one zero problem. So preferences closer to binary than total order. Okay, so in light of this, So both to keep the cycle short and to really, you know, leverage these now, you know, this accurate simple preference model, the plan is to use matching, okay, graph matchings. So let me explain. questions in the meantime. So a matching, as I'm hoping you know or picked up from that exercise set or what have you, a matching in a graph is just a collection of edges where no pair of edges shares an endpoint. Okay, so they're all mutually uh, non-adjacent edges. So how are we going to use matchings here? 
So what's the graph? So the nodes are just these incompatible patient donor pairs. Okay? So like in that picture, a node has both a patient and a donor. Okay, so that's the node set, incompatible pairs. And an edge just means between, you know, a given pair of pairs, if you will, it just means that we have the opportunity we have on that board. Okay, it means that uh, the first donor is compatible with the, sufficiently compatible with the second patient, and vice versa for the second donor and the first patient. Okay? So you can do this kidney exchange with a good probability of success. So mutually compatible uh, node pairs. Okay? So that's a graph, undirected graph. Told you the vertices, I've told you the edges. So we're now going to define the optimal solutions. Okay? So we're going we're to say what is the feasible solutions and which of those we want. And this will dictate which kidneys get exchanged with whom. Okay? So define the optimal solutions to just be the maximum cardinality matching. Okay? Which is, of course, you know, if you're using matching, this is the first thing you would think of. You just want to save as many lives as possible, as many successful transplants as possible. Okay? Now, we're, we're making a big assumption by saying the only feasible solutions are matching. Okay. It's, it's an assumption which I've already motivated. Uh, the motivation was keeping cycles short. Okay, so how short can cycles, are cycles going to be if we look only at matchings? It's only two. Right? So remember, the, the matchings don't overlap. Okay, so each of these corresponds to uh, exactly that picture there, an exchange between two pairs. So by formulating it as a matching problem, we have restricted ourselves to pairwise exchanges only. And again, you know, we are hoping to use mostly pairwise exchanges. That's already four simultaneous surgeries. I should tell you, though, that if you look at the algorithms that are used now with these national databases to find good matches, they do not restrict to pairwise exchanges. They also use three-way exchanges. Okay? And they look for them. So why do they do this? Well, the main reason is, is they just literally can save more lives by adding in three-way exchanges. Okay? So the logistics are more painful, but they're not impossible. And I forget the exact numbers, but you do really measurably better by allowing three-way exchanges than with merely two-way exchanges. Now, the phenomenon stops there. So people have certainly done, you know, run things allowing four-way exchanges, but the extra benefit from four or longer exchanges is minimal. Okay? So it doesn't make a big a difference. So the sweet spot seems to be allowing two-way and three-way exchanges as people understand the problem now. In this lecture, I will discuss only pairwise exchanges. We'll be using that matching model. Question. Yeah, so um, in the model, we will not make assumptions like that. Um, the model is just going to be this abstract matching model. Uh, empirically, I'm sure there are correlations. Um, and there are, you know, so, so sometimes when people have tried to get a finer grained understanding of certain issues, um, you know, in, including already trying to understand, I mean, so, so this four-way match thing, the first work was done empirically. Just, well, we have the data, let's just run the algorithm. You know, solve the integer program, get the best thing before it, and it doesn't really matter much. After that, people sought out theoretical reasons. 
for why four-way exchanges don't help. And then they really needed sort of more specific models about where the incompatibility, incompatibility comes from. So they really said, here are the blood types, here are the frequencies of the various blood types, here's the tissue incompatibility stuff. And so there you get more sophisticated models of, you know, because th then you're really trying to, pr you're trying to explain phenomena that are kind of special to this application domain. Whereas today, we're really just going to be talking about stuff you can do with matching, but this was the motivation. And this was the basis, you know, I mean, when they were sort of first trying to think about how to organize these things, this really was what they were thinking about. So this was the starting point. Um, is there any mechanism for handling a patient with multiple incompatible donors? Uh, excellent question. So the question is, what if you come with not just one donor, but two? So maybe you have a brother and a sister. They'd both be happy to give you um, a kidney, uh, but neither one works. In fact, um, so I'm going to state, for the mechanism I'm about to give you, I'm going to state a DSIC result. Um, and the DSIC result, I'll state, will basically say it's, near, it's, it's, it's uh, incentive compatible to report all of your edges. So everybody you're compatible with, uh, you, should just say, you should just say who you're compatible with. And that easily carries over to if you have multiple potential donors, it can only hurt you to hide any of them from the exchange. Because those basically correspond to more edges, more people you're compatible with. Yeah. So, I mean, that's how, um, I mean, the basic way they just handle is they take the union of the various people that any of them are compatible with, and then, of course, they're only going to match one of them. Okay, so not, both aren't going to have to donate. Why do you ask? You're saying because they're doctors, maybe they don't incentivize, or? That's right. Who do you think might be more crafty about this, actually, the doctors or the patients? So the thinking is that, yes, it's important to be incentive compatible because doctors might strategize. That is the thinking. Yeah. Um, good. All right, so the model sort of already suggested what this might be. So each node i, and again, you should think, it really, I would actually encourage you to think about this node as the doctor or the hospital representing this patient donor pair. So each node i knows amongst the other people in the pool which ones it's compatible with and which one it isn't. So put differently in sort of the graph, each node knows its neighborhood, it knows the incident edges. But it can report, or at least I'll use the word report, any subset. Now maybe you're wondering, you know, can sort of the exchange figure out the same things the doctors figured out from the health information or something. But the issue is, is you know, as a patient, and this is sort of in the law, you have a right to refuse any possible match with no questions asked. So if the algorithm says, we think you should match with this other person for the following reasons, you can be like, yeah, I'm not feeling it. I've got a bad feeling about this. Sorry. Okay? So there really, you really could manipulate this by, in a sense, re pre-rejecting uh, some number of your potential matches in the exchange. Okay? So think of that as under-reporting your edge set. Okay? You can't make up fictitious edges of compatibilities. Although that, if you think about it, probably wouldn't help you either. <laughs> but in the model, we disallow it. Okay. And so the goal is a DSIC mechanism. Of course, as we discussed, there can't be any money. Uh, so that I reports the entire set EI. Okay? And this extends to if you have multiple incompatible donors, we want to know about all of them. And again, remember, the other thing we want is we want to ma maximize surplus, which we're defining as having a maximum matching. Okay? Matching as many patient donor pairs as possible. So this is a sort of age-old question for us in this class at this point. We've seen many examples of DSIC surplus maximizing mechanisms. Of course, the difference here is that there's no money. Okay? So there's no VCG mechanism. And in general, in sufficiently general settings, there's impossibility results saying forget it. There's no way you can get both surplus maximization and DSIC. If there's time, we'll see a concrete example today. So the hope is that the 
problem structure is sufficiently nice that we still can get both surplus maximization, meaning a max matching, and DSIC in this sense. OK. So let me tell you the mechanism. Okay. Uh, so I guess we know we have to try to pick a max matching. Right? That's one of our goals. Um, so essentially, well, yeah. Okay. So the node set, we know who everybody is. We know who's registered in the database, incompatible patient donor pairs. We get reports. Fi for all i. Okay. Now we just sort of take the union of all the Fi's and look at the graph. Okay. Now we want an undirected graph, and there's a little bit of an issue here, because for arbitrary Fi's it might be the case that i says, oh, I have an edge to j, and j says I don't have an edge to i, which is tantamount to i saying I would accept a kidney from j, and j says, well, I won't accept one from i. And then obviously it's a no-go. Okay. So both endpoints have to agree that there's an edge between them. So what the mechanism does is it forms the obvious undirected graph just of the edges, ij, uh, such that both i and j report it, report it exi its existence. Okay. And then, you know, what else can you do, really? Return a maximum cardinality matching of G. Now, you'd be right to complain at this juncture. Any complaints? That is maybe a little underspecified, this mechanism. Hmm? How do you make ties? Yeah, that's the right complaint. We said there's only one max matching. If there's one max matching, it's clear what this thing does. Okay. And if there's more than one max matching, we have to make a decision. We've actually been lucky a lot, where for a lot of cases where there are ties in this class, it didn't really matter. And we'll have another example later in the class. Here it does matter. Okay. So we've got to pick the max matching uh, in sort of some kind of consistent way. All right, so which max matching? So matchings, maximum matchings can be uh, not unique. Actually, there's a couple of senses in which they can be not unique. And the first one, we don't, we, we don't care at all. Okay, so the first thing is, you can have two different matchings with different edges that match exactly the same set of nodes. Okay. So here are two perfect matchings. Everybody's matched, but I pair them up differently in the two cases. And remember, we're assuming that patients could care less who they get a kidney from, as long as it's from someone with whom they're highly likely to be compatible. Okay? So we're not even going to worry about the edges in the match. We're only going to worry about the vertices that get matched. We could care less which edges are used to create the matching. Okay? So this we don't care about. That's issue number one. Issue number two, we need to make some kind of executive decision about. Okay? Which is actually, you know, when you have a perfect matching, then clearly that's the max matching. Everybody gets matched. But when you don't have a perfect matching, someone's going to be left out. And sometimes different matchings leave out different people. An extreme case would be if you have a star. Okay. Patient one is set. But then everyone else is basically playing the lottery, where only one of these other n minus one spokes can actually be chosen in a, in a max matching. Okay, and we need to decide who. Okay, or we need to at least in our model, you know, figure out how we allow this to be decided. Um, so you have to define. You mean so you mean uniformly the set of all maximum matchings? Um, is it obvious that's DSIC? No. It, I, it's not obvious to me. It's, yeah, it's not obvious whether or not it's DSIC. I agree. Um, so th that's not unreasonable. But the only thing I'm trying to point out now is we need to make some decision. 
And it is the case that if we're completely careless with this decision, it's not going to be DSIC. Okay? And I'm going, to show, I'm going to just give you one simple approach that does lead to a DSIC mechanism. There's no claim it's the only one. Okay? And in particular, I'm going to do a deterministic version, which is pretty much the only thing that people are comfortable with in practice in this domain. Okay? Uh, I mean, in principle, I think you could do randomized, um, but that's sort of just not done in this domain. Okay, so, so here's going to be the kind of solution. And again, this is not the only way you could do this. The reason I signal this out is one, it's simple. Two, it's pretty closely related to how hospitals uh, sort of treat their patients and their waiting lists anyways. Okay, so this is maybe kind of minimum distance to existing policies, which is just a priority system. So up front, you order the nodes. And uh, let's just re-index the nodes so the ordering is from 1 up to n. The semantics here is 1 is the highest priority patient. You want them matched if at all possible. You know, then subject to that, you want 2 matched. Subject to that, you want 3 matched, and so on. Again, we don't care what edges are used. These are, these are nodes we're talking about. So how do, you actually, how do you actually implement these semantics? Oh, I should say, so, um, so hospitals, they actually do have patient priorities. They have like a scoring rule which takes you know, various properties of a patient. For example, how long they've waited on the waiting list. That boosts your score. Sometimes they take into account how rare it would be for this person to actually find a successful transplant. Depending on, for example, your blood type, you may be more or less likely uh, to be successful with someone else in the system. So they use features like that to formulate these priorities. And so they do have these prioritized lists. All right, so we know, we have to, we know we're going to output a max matching. So let's just sort of initialize with everything we might possibly output. So these are the max matchings of G. And again, the interesting case here is when there's no perfect matching. A max matching actually leaves a lot of people unmatched. And we have to figure out who are the ones that get left unmatched. And that's the, that's the key case here. All right, so now we just go through one at a time. And um, so let me just write this down. So in the first iteration, for example, you would say, well, are there any maximum matchings where one is actually matched? Okay? okay if actually, if, so if one is unmatched, if the most important person is unmatched in every single max matching, then there's nothing we can do. Okay? We can't pick one that includes one. Otherwise, we're going to funnel in on just those max matchings that do match, number one. Okay? Then we're going to repeat. So in general, when we get to iteration i, we have the matchings that are still permitted as outputs. And we say, well, are there any matchings in here where i is one of the match nodes? Okay, so let zi be those matchings. And there's two cases. So case one, the happy case for agent I, is that actually there is a matching at our disposal in which I is matched. Okay? And if there is, then we will from this point on commit to outputting at the end of the algorithm a matching where I is one of the matched people. Okay? So formally, we just set uh, the sort of feasible, possible feasible outputs for the next iteration to be the matchings that were feasible the previous iteration restricted to those that match I. So the unhappy case, case two for agent I, is actually given previous iterations commitments, there are no matchings left in which I is matched. Okay? So then we just say, sorry, agent I, we have to skip you. Okay? And we just keep the same set of feasible outputs that we had last iteration. So we start with all max matchings, and we slowly filter it to a smaller and smaller set. It's always not empty. We never let it go empty. But we make these successive commitments about which nodes are going to be in the maximum matching. And that gives us this sequence M0, M1, M2, up to Mn. I guess I forgot to say what we do at the end. At the end, we just output any. matching from the final set. 
from m, m sub n. I'm going to let you uh, absorb that. Yep. Um, so, in, like in practice, is the priority ordering, do, do the nodes themselves have any sort of say in whatever? Is there any doctors like lie about? You said the goal is to be SIC, but the doctors lie about characteristics of the patient to try to use the order. Yeah, so I mean, the details here I don't really know about. Um, I mean, in principle, sure. Um, but I mean, the, the things that I've seen that are the you know, first order factors about your priority don't seem very easy to me to manipulate. So like how long you've been on the waiting list. You know, and of course, you know, the, the longer you've been on, the better your score. Right? So the only thing you can do is drop off, but it'll actually hurt you. And then something like your compatibility information, it seems like you want to be honest about that just so that, you know, for the transplant itself, it's actually going to do the right thing, right? Are there opportunities for like minor manipulation? I would expect so, but I think to, f to first order, I haven't really heard complaints about that so much. But I, again, this is not my expertise, so. Okay, so that's the mechanism. So again, the way to think about this is we make a sequence of commitments. At the very beginning, we commit to outputting a max cardinality matching. That's our only initial commitment. Then we try to commit to outputting such a matching that matches one. Of course, if there's no way to do it, we give up on one. Otherwise, we do commit to matching agent one in our max cardinality matching. Each iteration, we say, given our previous commitments, is there a way to commit to matching agent I? If not, we skip it. Otherwise, we project to the matchings that also uh, match I. Okay. Good. So if you think about it a second, uh, all matchings in this final set match exactly the same set of nodes. There can be more than one element of M sub N. There can be different edges. But the et nodes that get matched by any such matching are exactly the nodes where you fell into case one. Okay, and I'll let you think about that. So, uh, so it's a well-defined output. Okay. And I'm going to leave it as an exercise to prove that it's DSIC. Okay. It's not too hard, but it's, it is a, it's slightly tricky. So I'm going to ask you to go through that in the privacy of your own home. All right, I gotta say, uh, this paper uses actually one of my absolute favorite theorems ever. Top five, maybe even top three theorems I've ever seen, which is called the uh, Galai Edmonds decomposition. It gives just this beautiful characterization of what the max cardinality matchings look like in an undirected graph. And I was so hoping I could find some excuse to like use some of this lecture to tell you about them, but I just, it was just too far afield, I couldn't justify it. But anyways, if you're feeling keen, maybe check out this 05 paper. Um, and they actually use the Goliadman's um, decomposition to implement, in particular, some randomized variants of these priority rules that have certain properties. Okay? But it's, it's a super cool theorem. All right, so that's what I wanted to say about matchings. I wanted to say a little bit about kind of what people are worrying about now with kidney exchange before I move on to stable matching. So any questions at this juncture? So, cutting edge. What are people worried about now? Okay, so I already mentioned the three-way exchanges. So that's something that's done. So the main thing on the incentive side that people are worrying about is getting the incentives right, not on the level of individual patient donor pairs, but on the level of hospitals. Because actually with these nationwide exchanges, generally hospitals are the ones responsible or that you know, take charge of reporting the incompatible donor pairs to the exchange, not the actual individuals themselves. Okay. So getting the, right in the incentives right for hospitals. And it'll, it'll be clear what I'm talking about if I show you an example. Two examples, actually. So imagine there are two hospitals in the world or in the, in the country, reporting to this exchange. H1 and H2. Okay. Each one has three incompatible donor patient pairs. I'm going to draw exactly the same kind of graph we were talking about in the matching case, so for pairwise exchanges. So let's suppose the compatibility graph looks like this. It's just a path 
on these six nodes. Okay. So again, the top three pairs belong to one hospital, and that one hospital is making a coordinated report of its pairs to the exchange. Same thing for H2. The main thing I want you to notice is both H1 and H2 have the opportunity to go ahead and do one of these pairwise exchanges internally. Okay, so for just sort of you know swapping one and two or swapping five and six, these hospitals don't even need to report the existence of these pairs to the exchange. In some sense, it doesn't need the exchange's help to get one and two compatible with each other or five and six. Okay, is that clear? On the other hand, you still would really like them to report. Okay, so one outcome, which is not the one we want, which is that the first hospital does the surgeries with one and two without telling anybody. H2 does the same thing for five and six, and then they report their leftovers to the exchange, namely the pairs three and four. They're not compatible, so the exchange is not in a position to help if it's only given three and four. If, on the other hand, the two hospitals resist doing these matches internally, okay, and they report all three of the pairs to the exchange, then using the vertical edges, everybody can be matched. Okay? So the point is, if people try to handle as much internally as possible, and there are incentives for doing that, okay, you want to sort of have as many as your own patients, uh, you know, so you want to save their lives, you also want to do the surgeries in-house, because then you sort of make money on the surgeries, frankly. So if they try to do as much stuff in-house as possible, we'd only get four pairs taken care of. If they report everything, we get all six. So we want, at the hospital level, we want hospitals to be incentivized to report all pairs, including those that they're in a position to match internally. Okay, that's the point of this example. The point of the second example is that this is easier said than done. So instead of a path on six nodes, suppose we have a path on seven nodes. So suppose we have truthful reporting. Okay? meaning that actually the two hospitals really do tell the exchange about all seven of these patient donor pairs. How many of those nodes are going to get matched? Six. But I mean, there's seven nodes. You can't match an odd number of nodes. So one of these seven, that will belong either to H1 or to H2. You have a choice. There's more than one max matching. But any max matching will leave somebody unmatched. Okay. So, what, so say you're H1, and you've taken a little game theory. Is there anything you're tempted to do? So what's really tempting is to just not admit the existence of two and three to the exchange. Right. So if you're H1 and you hide the existence of 2 and 3, you're left with this graph. Okay, so 1 is now an isolated node. And all that's left other than that is a path with 3 hops, 4, 5, 6, 7. The unique max matching in this graph is to match 4 with 5 and 6 with 7. And then H1 can surreptitiously internally match 2 and 3. Okay? So that's a way to guarantee that all three of its patients get matched. Okay? And again, if it reported everything, it could not guarantee that all of its patients got matched. Okay. So H1 wants to hide 2 and 3. What about H2? Well, 7 is not under H2's control. So it's five and six is the one you want to hide. Okay. 
Uh, so you, ultimately, you want to sort of force there being a unique max matching on what's left that covers all of your unhidden nodes. So if H2 hides nodes 5 and 6, that leaves just an isolated node 7, and it leaves this three-hop path on 1, 2, 3, 4, the unique max matching of which matches 1 and 2 and 4 and 3. And H2 can just go ahead and surreptitiously handle 5 and 6 internally. So again, H2 has an incentive to hide two pairs to ensure that all of its patients uh, are matched. Okay. So what I've just given you actually is an impossibility result. Okay, I've actually just shown you that you cannot have surplus maximization in the form of max matching and DSIC in the form of hospitals have a dominant strategy to report all of the information to the exchange. This shows it cannot be done. Okay? But this, I mean, this is the real world. This is really how it works. You really do have hospitals reporting these things to the exchanges, and they do have the ability to hide these pairs if they want. So you, know, you do the best you can. There's some trade-off between surplus maximization and sort of incentive compatibility on the part of the hospitals, and you just try to find a sweet spot where you give up not very much on either one. So that's sort of exactly what uh, a lot of the research in this field has been doing over the past couple of years, at least on the algorithmic game theory side. Okay. Cool. <coughs> so any questions before stable matching? That's all I got on kidney exchange. How many of you have seen stable matching before? Oh, cool. That warms my heart. Even so, it's something I can't not teach in an algorithmic game theory class. And it's so fun, why would you, why would you not do it? All right, so... Um, the setup is you have uh, two sets of nodes, U and V, typically called the men and the women, respectively. Each has the same size, let's say N people each. And everybody's got an opinion. Okay? Each node on one side has a ranked list of everybody on the other side, okay? of who they like better. So for example, maybe n equals 3, maybe um, all of the men agree on the relative ordering of the women, preferring d to e to f, whereas the women disagree about the ordering of the men. So this would be the input, a ranked list for each of the nodes on the other side. What we want to understand, the objects are stable matchings. Defined as perfect matchings, that is a matching in which everybody is matched. And the stability comes from the following property. So if you look at any pair which is not matched, okay, so again, the first thing is you have to be a perfect matching. Okay, so there are n pairs that are matched. Then there are all these pairs that were not matched. For each of them, almost n squared of them, it should, it should be the case that either So either um, U prefers its mate, V prime, so that is whoever actually got matched to in this allegedly stable matching, V prime, it should prefer V prime to V, this person to whom it was not matched, or V prefers its mate, U prime, 
in the allegedly stable matching to you. Okay? So the reason you'd be in trouble if both of these conditions failed is that then they'd be susceptible to U and V running off together. Okay? They'd both be happier off than with their current proposed mates. So if there's no pair of nodes, unmatched, who mutually agree they'd rather run off together, then it's called a stable matching. Okay? Good. Doing case studies on stable matching, I'm not doing it because it would be sort of like shooting fish in a barrel. This is kind of like too easy almost, too straightforward. So um, the algorithm I'm about to show you, the proposal algorithm credited to Gale and Shapley, uh, they came up with it in 62. It actually turns out exactly the same algorithm, unbeknownst to them, was invented earlier, 10 years earlier almost. And since the 50s, it has been used to assign recent graduates from medical school to their residencies. So one side of the graph is the doctors, and, or the residents, and the other side of the graph is the hospitals. There are other applications as well, not only to labor markets, but also to uh, school choice, assigning students to elementary schools. Question. Yeah, so you can extend the stability notion much like the way we talked about the core of the top trading cycle algorithm, uh, where you can ask about large subsets that might want to succeed and do better. Uh, so you can define the core in that way. It turns out the elements of the core are exactly the stable matchings. So with this setup, it turns out pairwise coalitions, if you can get them all happy, that's a sufficient condition to get everybody happy of any size. Is there something in the back? Excuse me? Perhaps you know better than I do. Not sure. I'm aware of the 50s, so. Doctors, school kids, etc. I would say the similarities to actual courtship are superficial. So, here's how it works. So you have a main loop. Okay, so initially nobody's matched. So as long as there's some man, so some node on the left-hand side who's not attached, okay? Uh, let's call it U. If there are many such choices for you, you pick one arbitrarily. So U proposes to its top rank option who hasn't already rejected him. In other words, each man just works its way steadily down its list, starting from the top. Each woman entertains only its best offer so far. So the woman always accepts the first offer that's deemed to be better than no offer. Uh, and then, your mileage may vary, but uh, every time uh, you're proposed to a man who is higher in your own preference list than the one you're currently entertaining, you break off the old engagement and start a new one. Okay? So over the course of the algorithm, from a given woman's perspective, they're engaged to these success, successively higher ranked men. Okay? Oh yeah, where's my example? Here's my example. Good. So, so over here, for example, we might begin by picking A. A likes D best. D accepts, because that's the first offer. So now A is attached, B and C are unattached. Maybe we pick B. B also prefers D, so B proposes to D. D says, no, that's worse than an offer I've already got. So that's rejected. Maybe then we move on to C. C also tries its luck with D. Again, it's rejected. D prefers A to B to C. Now maybe we return to B. Maybe B goes for its second choice, E. That's accepted. C tries for E and is rejected. 
then goes to F. And so the stable matching computed by this algorithm in this instance is just the three horizontal lines. So the claim is that, the claim is threefold. So first of all, the algorithm terminates, in fact, in at most n squared iterations. Second of all, when it terminates, it terminates with a matching that, first of all, is perfect. And second of all, is stable. Okay? As a consequence, no matter what the preference lists, a stable matching always exists, a fact which a priori is by no means obvious. So this is a constructive proof of that. So theorem gets stable matching. All right. So first of all, let's just figure out that it halts. So how many proposals could a given man possibly make? N, right? It just walks from its list from top to bottom. Okay, it never goes, it never reproposes to someone it's already proposed to. So if it's the most n per man, it's the most n squared overall. So how about the perfect matching property? It starts to get a little more interesting now. So suppose not. Okay. So if it's not a perfect matching, then in particular there's some man who is unmatched at the end, which means it unsuccessfully tried to propose to every single one of the end women. Okay. Now, when one of those women rejected him, it's because they either already had a better offer or she received a better offer later. Okay. So in any case, this man was rejected because of the woman he was proposing to was engaged. And remember, with a woman, it's once engaged, always engaged in this algorithm. Okay? You only are engaged to better and better men as the algorithm proceeds. So that would say so some man rejected by all V and V. So that would reply that all women are matched at the end. Okay, because once engaged, always engaged. But if all the women are matched, well, they can only be matched to the men, so all the men are matched. But the initial assumption was that one was not matched. So that's a contradiction. The claim is, in fact, not just a perfect matching, but a stable matching. So why? Consider a pair which is not matched by the Gale Shapley algorithm. How could that be? Well, it can happen in two ways. One is that you never bothered to propose to V in the first place. Well, U is working its way down its list from top to bottom. So if it didn't get to V, that means it stopped, i.e. the algorithm ended, somewhere above V. So U ends the algorithm match to a V prime it prefers to V. Okay, so that's enough to block, that's enough to satisfy the stability property. Well, suppose, uh, suppose you did propose at some point. Well, then either at that very moment, it was already the case that V was engaged to somebody she liked better than you, 
Or maybe later on in the algorithm, she got an offer from somebody she likes better than you. Either way, the reason you proposed to V and you was not matched to V at the end of the algorithm could only be because V got a better offer. Okay? And then, as the algorithm concludes, the quality of the man to whom V is engaged could only be higher. So it's always going to be the case that it's better than you. That's the Gale-Shapley theorem. Okay. The proposal algorithm terminates quickly n squared iterations with a stable match. I mentioned that the algorithm is underdetermined. For example, in the very first iteration, every single man is unattached, so you have n choices of who you pick. In general iteration, there can be many different choices for which unattached man gets to propose. Now, if there were only one stable matching, then by virtue of always terminating with a stable matching, it would be clear that the output of the algorithm was independent of those decisions. However, it is not the case that there was always a unique stable matching. There was in the one example I showed you, but there is not in this one here. So imagine both sides disagree on who is better on the other side. Whoops. Good, 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 good. Good, good, good. So because this particular implementation of Gale-Shapley I showed you is um, the male proposing version of it, in this case, where the men disagree on who's better, well, each one is going to propose to its favorite. And this will be the output. Okay? And it's a stable matching just because each man gets their favorite choice. Okay? So they're never going to want to elope with anybody else. Each of the two women get their least favorite choice. Okay? I could, of course, run it from the right-hand side. I'd get uh, something different. That would also be a stable matching with the opposite properties, where both women get their favorite choice and both men get their least favorite choice. Okay? So there can be multiple stable matchings. When, so now we might be wondering if the Gale-Shapley algorithm outputs different ones depending on how we run it. Okay? So let me explain why it always outputs exactly the same stable matching, no matter how you run it. And they'll also give you the clue for why it should be strategy proof for the men, i.e. if the preferences are private, they should report truthfully, and why it should not be strategy proof for the women, which are the final two points I want to make in the lecture. So to make that precise, fix the men and the women and their preferences. As we now know, there can be multiple stable matchings. Okay? In fact, there can be a lot of different stable matchings. So, for a given man, let's think about his best case scenario, okay? So, for you and you, but the best case scenario for you be the top ranked woman matched to you in some stable matching. Okay. So conceptually, I just iterate over every single stable matching. You're not going to be matched to the same woman in every single one, but you'll have one favorite okay, over the whole set of stable matchings. That's B of U. And the theorem, which is kind of amazing on a few different levels, is that no matter how you choose the proposer in every iteration, the output of Gail Shapley, it's not just uniquely defined, but it's crisply defined exactly as the B of U's. So it matches each U and capital U to B of U in V. 
So it's simultaneously optimizing for every single node on the left-hand side. Okay? So remember, B of U says, suppose I don't care about anybody else in V or in U. I just make little U as happy as possible. B of U is as happy as I can make little U. Okay? But you know, conceivably, I'm using very different stable matchings to make man number one happy versus man number two happy. And this says, no, actually, there's just a single stable matching where from every single left node's perspective, they're as well off as they could be in any stable match. Okay? So that's pretty amazing. As a consequence, scale shape is uniquely defined. This is certainly suggestive that if you're one of the left-hand side nodes, given that you're getting your best option in any single stable matching, probably you should report truthfully. Okay? And that's a true fact, but it's not trivial, actually. I'm going to put that on problem set three. It okay? takes some work. Okay? Secondly, it should be intuitive, and this is easy enough, I'll put it in the exercise set, that if you're on a right-hand side node, okay, it turns out an analog of this theorem is that you're getting your least favorite option in any stable matching. As you might expect, it's not strategy-proof to input your true preferences if you're a right-hand side node. Okay? So those are the key incentive compatibility properties of the gale shapley algorithm. Strategy-proof on the left, not on the right. So I'll see you next week for Selfish Routing and the Price of Anarchy.